morning, everyone. Good morning. If you would stand with me, please. We're going to have Janet lead us in a few songs here, and then we will uh, resume together up here. But yeah, if you would, Janet, take us in a time with the Lord. All right. Thank you, Janet. Please be seated. Thanks for braving this cold winter morning. Good to see some of you out here that are familiar faces, new faces. Good to see you here this morning. I um, want to start out with something we've been doing for a little while, which is just Given you guys an opportunity to share some prayer re requests, some praise reports. So if there is 
anyone that has a prayer request or a praise report right now, we've got a microphone because, see, we're being live streamed here, so it's hard if we share and we don't have the mic going. So let's, uh, yeah, share the prayer request with the mic in that way. And it's Jody. Jody. Okay. And when we, yeah, when we use that mic, then the people watching online can hear your prayer requests and praise reports too. It's perfect. Um, we need to keep Val in our prayers. Yeah. I think she's doing pretty good, but. Yeah. And Connie. And then I think Karen had one too, uh, Randy. Um, I did mention at UMW that I had received a call from Eleanor Loading, but just for others that didn't hear it, that they did have a bad car accident when they were on their way to Florida a couple weeks ago. And she messaged me again this week and said that uh, she finally gave in and went to the doctor. She was hurting so bad, and he is, gave her a pretty good all clear except for the foot, and maybe less can relate to that, but <laughs> it, uh, it, it hurts, she says. So he is sending her to a podiatrist and hoping that they can find the cause of that. And Eleanor, right? Eleanor and Richard Bowman. Okay. Cherry pies next week. They'll be making crusts on Tuesday and cherry pies on Wednesday, uh, the 16th and 17th. So if anyone wants, could get some orders for us, we'd appreciate it. And we also can use the help, of course. Nine o'clock, the 16th and 17th. Thank you. Through everything that's going around in this country and everything. This week has been a tremendous blessing for us because gospel music was presented every night this week from 6.30 to 10.30. That's one of some of our favorite singers and what a blessing it was to just sit and, and watch that and listen to that and not have to watch some of the other stuff that's on television. <laughs> Praise the Lord for Bill Bailey that presented that. Nice. Thanks, Arthur. And I have one for, for Bill and Kim, so I'll definitely include that in our time of prayer as well. All right, so if that's what we have this morning, can somebody help me with Connie? What, what are we praying for specifically for Connie? Marjorie, you mentioned Connie. Okay. It's a real deal and extra difficult right now with things. Well, if you would all join me in prayer, let's bow our heads and, and direct our time to the Lord. God, this is so important that we share each other's burdens. God, that this is something that is what you've asked the body to do to come alongside other people, uh, people both that, um, that we know personally, some of us that we don't know personally, God, but uh, the body has been asked by you to shoulder the burdens of others. And so, God, we know one of the best ways to do that is to take concerns to you. And so, Lord, we are laying down at your feet some prayer requests this morning. You are aware of them, God, but we just are coming alongside as you've asked us to do and praying for these things. God, we're praying that Jody can receive some, some incredible healing in intensive care right now, Lord, and we pray that her situation would just steadily improve. God, we pray for mercy and grace on her life. God, we pray for 
for Val, who fell. And Lord, yes, I spoke with her earlier this week. Sounds like she is doing well, but there is that feeling of discouragement and being in this place again. This is not the first time that she's had a situation like this. And God, just we pray for encouragement. Help her, Lord. Encourage her heart. We pray for Connie, God. We pray for her and others like her who are facing just a hard time, especially right now, God, feeling lonely. This pandemic has certainly amped up that feeling of loneliness in the hearts of so many. And so, God, we pray you would meet with her and others all over the world and remind them that you are present and that they really aren't alone. And we pray, God, also that there be tangible people that could come and spend time with them or write them or call them. God, we pray you'd use your people to also meet that need of, of relationships. And God, we pray for, for Eleanor. We, we're happy, God, that her outcome is, is very good, that she just has an issue with a, with a foot. And Lord, we just pray that the doctors can just come to the bottom of that and help her to fully heal. And Lord, we lift up Bill and Kim to you. And God, they are going to be looking here soon to, to be in a new state, a new place. And Lord, we just pray you'd help them to find the exact home that they're supposed to be in. Give them peace about that, patience with that, Lord. And we're thankful, God, for how you do bless us. Lord, for the music that, that Arthur mentioned this week, just kind of a distraction from all of the hard and difficult things that have been on the news. Lord, we're thankful for things that can remind us of your goodness. We're thankful for music, for gospel music. We're thankful, God, for the arts in general. We're thankful for, Lord, how you work in our lives, the common grace that extends in so many ways in our world. We're thankful for that. Thank you for the hard work, God, that this church puts in to make it what it is. And Lord, we are thankful, Lord, for you and your word. And we pray that you would just meet us now, teach us now, that your Holy Spirit would be all over this time as we turn now to the Gospel of Mark to learn more about you. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Like I said, good to see you. Glad you braved the cold weather this morning. Uh, cherry pies, as a reminder, she said Tuesday, Wednesday, 16th, 17th, they'll be doing cherry pies. Of course, people are going to be uh, uh, looking for you guys to, to you know, put in orders or to get people who maybe would be interested in some pies and share that with them. And of course, some extra set of hands is always beneficial too. So there's that as well. So here we are, Mark's Gospel, new series. We're actually going to be in this gospel for nine weeks. We're going to conclude Mark's gospel on Easter. And so this is where we're going to be for a little while. So uh, settle in. And I encourage you on Facebook this week to read ahead, at least to the first chapter. But Mark's gospel is one that you can spend uh, not too much time in and get all the way through. So if you read the gospel of Mark several times during this study, that'd be fantastic. In fact, let me tell you a little bit about Mark's gospel. I'll give you an introduction here, and then we'll get into our study today. Mark's gospel was, of course, written to be read, but even more so, it was written so it would be orally presented. In fact, it has many of the similarities of Greek theater. And so scholars think that that's really how Mark intended his gospel to be primarily presented which makes sense. Not everyone could read back then, and it would be more memorable. It would have grabbed people's attention. And so we have this concept of Mark's gospel being very dramatic, right? In fact, also, I should say that Mark's gospel, and, and this is something coming from the New Testament in antiquity, a book that I'll reference probably fairly often in our series, as that the gospel explains many of the Jewish customs and practices. So we know that Mark's audience wouldn't have been just for Jewish people because we see in Mark's gospel explaining things that someone who was not a Jew would need to know. Now there is this 
expectation that they'd have a little understanding of Christian words and concepts, but as a whole, Mark does a good job of explaining the background of Jewish thought. No wonder, though, with all of this, the drama, the fast pace, as we go through Mark's gospel, it's not any surprise that actually, anybody who's seen this presentation done, I know it's a little hard to see there, but that is Max McLean. He's part of the Fellowship for Performing Arts in, thank you, Randy, in New York. They do Christian theater, and he presented Mark's Gospel, and it's fantastic. My wife and I actually just purchased this last night. So you can get it on, um, I think, VMO and others where you can purchase this, and you can watch this performance. It's him literally doing the Gospel of Mark all by himself. Going through it for an hour and a half, he plays all the roles, and he's just sharing it like I said it probably was intended to be. It's very cool. So that link will be on our Facebook page after today. And it's not a surprise, because like I said, that's how Mark's gospel was intended to be presented. It's interesting, too, my compact little NIV uh, study Bible states that the introduction um, here in its introduction of Mark's gospel, that Mark stressed facts and details. So when we go through Mark's gospel, you're going to see facts and details being stressed. Sometimes Mark's gospel has more details than the other gospels. Not always, but you're going to see that sometimes. Also, too, the introduction to that little uh, um, compact NIV Bible that I was referring to says more than anything, Mark's gospel is about action. Anybody read ahead this week and, and feel like you caught that? Even in the first chapter alone, the ESV says over and over the word immediately to push the action forward. If you're reading in the King James, it's going to say immediately and straightway. You're getting this feeling that we're going from one thing to the next. Now, many scholars also, when we're thinking about the gospel of Mark as a whole, believe that the information primarily in this gospel came from Peter. So Peter was that eyewitness testimony that Mark, the writer, got much of his information from. Now, let's imagine this for a minute. I mean, imagine this. Think about, many scholars think that Mark's gospel was the first gospel written. So up until that time, Jesus was crucified, we're not sure, somewhere approximately A.D. 30, 33, somewhere in there. And scholars have dated Mark's gospel as early as A.D. 55. So within 20, 25 years, roughly, you have this complete oral presentation, drama, if you will, circulating. And you can imagine people saying, hey, did you hear have you heard? You know, all these stories that we've heard about Jesus, many of them are now put together in this story, and they're sharing it at so-and-so's house. And somebody, are you really? Seriously? You got to check it out. This is so interesting, because everything we've heard about Jesus is now being put together, or most of what we've heard about Jesus is in this concise story, and it's called the Gospel of Mark. And of course, people would want to know more about Jesus because we know, we have, looking from our perspective, so much knowledge about Jesus, but there would have been just so much circulating about Jesus, but there would have been still so many questions. Who is Jesus? And that's exactly what Mark's gospel intends to answer. Who was and is Jesus? And so that's where we're going to go. Probably no surprise here, but that's where we're going to be focusing our time over this series. And our primary focus will be answering that question, who was and is Jesus? Nevertheless, as we go along, I'll do my best to bring clarity to some of the more puzzling passages as we get into them, and also emphasize how Jesus' life, his teachings, his sacrificial death, his resurrection, his ascension, all of it. How is that relevant to our lives today? How is what Mark is teaching that first century world still relevant to our 21st century world? 
Now let me say this. For those of us who've grown up in the church for some time, we recognize, well, I know how Jesus' life is relevant. I get that. I know that Jesus' life is relevant because I need him for my salvation. Jesus' life changes my life. I get that. And so we understand that. Nevertheless, it's important that those of us in the church can effectively explain that to others. I mean, if someone was to ask us, why is Jesus relevant now? And then give you, fill in the blank, their situation and what they're going through. It can be sometimes hard to articulate that. And I understand that. Conversations with coworkers, conversations with family, conversation with friends, and the topic about Jesus or faith can come up, and it's hard to articulate why Jesus is relevant to our world, to our conversations that are critical, to the questions and heartfelt needs that we have. It can be hard to articulate that. So this study really is meant both for those who have been in the church for some time and walked with Jesus for many years, and for those who are new to Christianity and Jesus. In addition, as we walk through our study, each week I'll have a theme for the study. And this will make it easier for our minds to grasp the information, because let's be honest, as we go through this, it's hard to grasp it, especially when you sit here and hear someone present it orally. There's just a lot that we're going to take in. So for today, the theme for today is that Jesus was simply amazing. That's going to be what we focus on today. So I'm going to start out. Ready to kick off? You guys ready for this? All right. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you were amazed by someone or something? When I asked myself that question, it took a little bit. So I'll give you just a second. Not that you have to come up with an answer or that I'm looking for anyone to answer it. But just think about when was the last time, in a good way, you were amazed by something or someone. Well, since it's Super Bowl Sunday, I thought I would give an example of amazing moment in Super Bowl history. Now, this was in 2008, Super Bowl 42. And at the time, the New England Patriots were coming in and they were undefeated for the season. Heading into the Super Bowl. Hadn't lost a game all year. And they were playing the New York Giants. Anybody remember this game? Yeah. Now, let me give you the, the kind of, I'm going to speed up. The game was a close game the entire time. Now, there was a minute and 10 seconds left in the game. The score was Giants 10, New England 14. Now, the Giants had the ball and it was third down and five. For those of you not familiar with football, you get four chances to earn a next first down. You got to get 10 yards more to then get your next first down. They were third and five, so they had five yards to go to get their next first down. And remember, they don't got any timeouts. And it's a minute and 10 seconds left in the game. They're not in great field position, and they have to score a touchdown because a field goal isn't going to do nothing for them. That's only three points. It's 10 to 14, minute 10 seconds left, and the ball is snapped, and Eli Manning is immediately under pressure. Everyone gathers around him from New England. He's actually grabbed by a couple of guys. Somehow he breaks free, comes out of the pocket, and throws the ball wildly down the field, and this is what happens. There's this incredible catch. This incredible catch is made. By David Tyree. He literally jumps up, catches this football, and you can see here he actually uses his helmet to help hold on to it, right? He holds on to it the whole time. It's a complete pass, and it sets him up for perfect field position. And with less than a minute, they score a touchdown, and the Giants defeat the undefeated Patriots. Amazing. Now, some of you might be like, that's not too amazing. But I think it was. In fact, believe it or not, this is one now considered best catches in Super Bowl history. If you look this up, it's called the helmet catch. I mean, it literally changed the outcome of that game. Amazing, right? Well, we'll see how Brady fares today, right? Against Mahomes and the Chiefs. But uh, I guess I just will say we'll wish both teams well. I always just hope no one gets hurt. It's a good game. 
All right, so with that, let's look at how Jesus amazed and continues to amaze. All right? Mark 1.1. 1, 1. If you want to follow along, there should be Bibles with you. If you're using one of the Bibles the church provides, we're going to be on page 1045, the Gospel of Mark. You're welcome to use your phone. I'll give you a second to get there. Tie my shoelaces because I might get just a little wild up here. All right, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. You, if you're reading through uh, the King James Version, it's going to say it a little differently. It's going to say the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is essentially the same thing. What is the gospel? The good news. What is Messiah? Christ, right? So you have the same thought here, just in the, here in the NIV, and we see here the beginning of the good news, the gospel about Jesus, the Messiah, or Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. Now, to help you guys this morning, I just want you to know, basically, Mark 1, I broke into two sections, just for our study. So the first um, verses 1 through 20, we're going to look at, then we're going to uh, look at some passages on how they're relevant to our lives today, and then we'll look at section two, and then look at some relevancy there at the end. So that's where we're kind of headed with our study. Christ, Messiah. Messiah is a concept that is not strictly Christian or Jewish, is it? There's lots of religions and stories out there that have this special chosen one that people are wanting to, to follow or looking for, anticipating for their coming, but no religion describes a Messiah quite like Christianity. Check out this Messianic, that's what they call it, it's kind of a funny word. A Messianic really speaks of this, this Messiah, so if we say a Messianic prophecy or passage, they're speaking about a passage or um, a verse or a prophecy that speaks of Jesus. Check out this Old Testament Messianic passage here in Isaiah. Now, this passage actually starts in Isaiah 52, goes all the way to Isaiah 53 to the end, and this is known as the Suffering Messiah passage. Many of you maybe are familiar with this. We're going to look at just a portion of it here, just a few verses. So this is in the Old Testament. Isaiah says this about the Messiah who will come someday. Surely he took up our pain. And bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God. Did people, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, think, ah, he's getting what he deserves? They certainly did. People saw Jesus on that cross, and many said, he is getting what he deserves. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him who? The Messiah. The iniquity of us all. What an incredible passage about the coming Messiah in the Old Testament. There's another one. This one is in the Psalms, Psalm 22. Again, a psalm that for many, many years, Jews, even Jewish rabbis, would teach and say, this is about our coming Messiah. Check what it says here, just a couple of verses here. Dogs surrounded me. This is kind of told from the perspective of the Messiah. A pack of villains encircles me. Did Jesus not have people surrounding him at his crucifixion? Evil people, for sure. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. Or my garment. Psalm 22, 16 to 18. Again, this is an Old Testament passage that many Jews believed spoke of their coming Messiah. Let me make this point. 
The Old Testament does not state that the Messiah would come as a conquering king. Though it does declare that the Messiah would come from the line of David and be a king. It was, and I think is still just inferred by many, that the Messiah would be this great warlike hero, like David. But Jesus was not that. And in fact, the Old Testament teaches that he wouldn't be like that. That was just inferred by the people. When their Messiah came, he would make all things right and lead us into this victory. Jesus did make all things right and lead us into victory, but not the way anyone was anticipating. Check this out. There's Psalm 22, right? 16 through 18. Here's Matthew 27. Jesus. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Look at that perfect match. Psalm 22. Written long before Jesus ever came on the scene. And Jesus, his life fulfills that messianic or that Christ passage or prophecy about him. All right, back to Mark. Mark 1, 2, and 3. So we see here, Mark 1 says, This is the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Mark quotes, as we see here, here, Isaiah, and he's introducing to us John the Baptist. Who doesn't like John the Baptist? He's a cool guy. I mean, he's a straight shooter. He's kind of wild, kind of different. I like him eating honey and locusts and wearing whatever, man, he doesn't care. And he calls it out like it is, right? John the Baptist. So we're introduced to him. And we're told that John is paving the way for who? The Christ, the Messiah. Check it out here. Verses 4 through 8. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the One more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. People came from all over to confess their sins. Now, John wasn't starting anything new. He was a devout Jew, and like I said, he was just a straight-shooting prophet, and he was connecting the people to God. He was helping them And I think, honestly, even though he was kind of rough with his words at times, people respected him. And they appreciated his teaching, even though he was, like I said, just a straight shooting guy. Luke gives us a little bit more of a background on this, but first, here's a map. Sometimes it's helped to visually see what's going on here. The Judean countryside, can you guys see that? There's Judea right there and the orange on the bottom. And you can see right there, we got Samaria above that, and then... Uh, Perea and then uh, Diacopolis there, or I don't know, Decapolis or whatever. Um, Decapolis, I think. It's basically the ten cities. Deca is ten, and then it's talking about these ten cities are kind of oriented together. But there's kind of a, um, how it's pronounced, Decapolis, I think, is what people say. Uh, So here we see, and it's hard to see here, there's a, but you can see the Dead Sea next to Judea. Above that is the Jordan River, and it's running alongside Samaria and Perea. And that is where the Judean countryside, Jerusalem, they're all coming to the Jordan to see John. It's nice to see that visually. Now, Luke gives us some more details, because we're not given a lot of details at this point in Mark about John. But John said to the crowds, like I said, John's kind of a rough talker. And he says to the crowds, hey, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? And man, we can't get away from this concept of producing fruit, can we? 
It's just there. It's all over the place. We've been talking about it in Colossians and Timothy and other places in the past in our studies. And here we are seeing John say, produce fruit, keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Luke goes on to give us, because at this point, the crowds are asking him, well, what do we do? Gosh, you're telling me I need to produce fruit with repentance, because otherwise I'm in trouble. What do we do? The crowds want to know that. The tax collectors want to know that. Even the soldiers want to know that. And we see in these verses that Jesus, that are in between here, that Jesus, or not Jesus, but John the Baptist gives them some practical answers of what they're to do. And then we see here the people wondering about John. And they're wondering in their hearts, is John the Messiah? And we see here John says, no, I'm not. But I am telling you, I'm not even worthy to untie the person's shoelaces that's coming after me. This Messiah, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And of course, Luke adds here, fire, And we get this idea that Jesus is coming, and when he comes, it's going to be altogether new. It's going to be altogether different than what they can expect. So, John says this, and we can go back to our passage in Mark. John says, don't get any funny ideas about me. He says, I'm not the Messiah. The one coming after me, who I'm not even worthy, like I said, to untie his, his shoelaces, so to speak. He's coming. He's the Messiah. Don't get mixed up on what I'm doing. I'm just paving the way for him. He says this, I have water from the Jordan, but Jesus has the Holy Spirit. And that's how he's going to baptize you. Check out the verses here in Mark 1, 9 through 11. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth. Can you imagine? We're just in verse 9, and now we got Jesus on the scene, and here we go. Jesus came on the scene. He's coming from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Let's stop there for a second. There's two things I want to observe about these verses. Do you remember we just read that John was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins? Right? That was John's baptism. And his rhetoric was, you need to repent and live lives worthy of God by bearing good fruit. In fact, the whole Judean countryside, we're told, was coming to him and confessing their sins. So here's my question to all of you and to me. Why did Jesus need to be baptized? If this was a baptism John was doing for repentance and for confessing sins, why does Jesus need to be baptized? Well, Matthew's gospel gives us a clue on this. Matthew's gospel here, the same scenario, we're talking about the same moment in time, Matthew just captures more of the details. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But what do we see John do? John tries to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, Jesus. And you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Let me walk through this for just a minute with you guys. Jonathan Pennington, professor of New Testament interpretation at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, he wrote an article about this. I will have it on our Facebook page after the message. He says that righteousness in Matthew's gospel really has this righteousness that the Old Testament has in mind, which is really about how one in their whole person wants to make their life worthy of God. 
that they want to please God and be in accord with God's will, his nature, and his coming kingdom. So Matthew's righteousness is closely connected, like I said, to this Old Testament idea of just being deeply faithful to God. And Pennington adds, when we see here that Jesus submits to John's baptism, it's really showing himself to be the good and obedient son who does God's will perfectly. Furthermore, do we see anywhere in Scripture where it says Jesus confesses his sins? No. The whole Judean countryside was coming and they were confessing their sins. When we see Jesus coming to get baptized, we see that John's like, this is backwards. I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus says, I get it. But I'm wanting everyone to understand I'm coming and this is now my time. This baptism is about ready to mark the beginning of my ministry where I am fully in line with what God has sent me to do at this point. Not that Jesus wasn't in line with what God has sent him to do prior to this, but this was the beginning of his official ministry. All right? So we can see here, and let me, let me add this to you. Um, furthermore, nowhere does Scripture, like I said, Je- says that Jesus confessed any sin. And as Pennington noted... This righteousness and for Jesus, this repentance was about him just being dedicated to God's will completely and to God's purposes on earth. When Jesus was baptized, he was showing complete obedience to the Father and making, like I said, this public declaration, my ministry officially has begun. And no doubt, Jesus became the one that would fulfill all righteousness, didn't he? And so that is true. And not that John got all that, but I think John got enough of it to understand, okay, what you're saying is different. This baptism is different than any other baptism I've ever performed. And if that wasn't enough, let's go back to those passages. What happens as soon as Jesus is baptized? We're talking about how Jesus amazed people, right? That Jesus was amazing. I mean, talk about this moment in time if you were John. John concedes to Jesus' desires to be baptized, and when Jesus is coming up out of the water, what on earth heaven is torn apart? What does that even mean? I mean, we can't wrap our minds around that. I don't know what that would have been like, but something very supernatural happened in this moment. Jesus is coming out of the water, and something like a dove descends on Jesus, John says it's the Holy Spirit. This is what's going on. It's altogether incredible. And then there's this voice. This voice that says, this is my beloved son who I am well pleased with. This was no ordinary John the Baptist baptism. This was altogether new and different. Jesus' baptism was wasn't like the other baptisms that John performed. And John was right in a sense. Jesus should have baptized him, but this was for a different purpose and to fulfill all that God had said that is right, to do what is right. What an amazing scene and experience, like I said, this must have been. That was point number one I wanted to make in this passage. Point number two, let's go back here to verse 8 let's see here, Mark 8. Do you notice here what we say? John the Baptist said this. He said, look, I'm not the Messiah. The one coming after me is going to be greater than me, and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. We see here in his baptism, what comes on Jesus? The Holy Spirit. Then we read just a little farther. We haven't got here yet, but we're going to read it right now together. The very next couple of verses. At once what? The Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness. I mean, the Holy Spirit is all over what Jesus is doing. I mean, He, the Holy Spirit is, it's like it's interwoven to Jesus' ministry and His purposes. God is showing Himself in this way. And He's saying, Jesus is my Son. 
and I'm validating him in this way. The Holy Spirit is totally intimately connected to what Jesus is doing. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, he was with the wild animals and angels attending him. And we know what from the other Gospels, some of the other Gospels, Jesus resisted Satan's temptation by quoting the word of God. And of course, no doubt, depending on the strength of the Holy Spirit. All right, let's look at Mark 14 and 15. It says, and after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. If any of you, anybody of you like to read the Bibles that have the red letters? It's kind of nice sometimes, right? Kind of nice to be like, oh, there's, there's where Jesus is talking. Well, if you have one of those, and I, it's fine either way. If you do, you don't, doesn't matter. But if you do, it's really obvious that this is the first time Jesus has said anything in Mark's gospel. This is the first time Jesus says something in Mark's gospel, and we see here him saying the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Doesn't what Jesus say match what John was doing? So John was paving the way. This baptism of repentance where people were coming out and confessing their sins, and Jesus says, hey, I am coming now, officially on the scene. God is all over this. The Holy Spirit is in this. And now I am going to be preaching this. And the, thing, the message I'm proclaiming is the time has come. The good news is at hand. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Let's go into these verses, and then we're going to talk about this. We're getting close to our first section being done. Jesus here, as soon as that's done, we see Jesus walking along the side of the sea, and he sees Simon, who we know as Peter, as we get later into the scripture, and his brother Andrew. They're casting nets into the lake, for they were fishermen, and Jesus says, come follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Or your King James, I'll make you a fisherman of men, Right? At once they left their nets and followed him. And then the, verses 19 and 20, it's pretty much the same scenario. Jesus is walking a little farther down the road. We see uh, James and John, and he does the same thing. He calls them, and they immediately follow him. Does anybody think that's strange? It's a little strange, right? I mean, come on. I mean, people are just working, and this guy who's walking along, and he says, hey, come follow me. I'll make you a fisher of men. And so I'm like, yeah, you're right. See you, Dad. I mean, come on, it's a little odd, right? Let's be real. But it's important to note, honestly, there's two things we need to note. Mark is containing information, one, to move this drama narrative forward. He doesn't want to get into some of the details that would slow down his theater-type presentation. John's gospel actually contains probably the first encounter that Simon and Peter and John had with Jesus. So this isn't the first time they've encountered Jesus. But Mark doesn't want to waste time getting into those details. This is drama. This is theater being presented. He wants you to get the facts, but in a way that it can continue to move forward. So John's gospel really has the first encounter of three, maybe even James, They'd heard about Jesus. They had met Jesus. It was now this deciding point. They're like, all right. Dad probably knew about what they were contemplating. And it was now at this point they said, I'm following Jesus. It shouldn't also, though, take the wonder out of this moment. Because here's the thing. We can almost then swing the pendulum the other way and be like, oh, not a big deal then. It's still a big deal. There is still wonder in this because Jesus was not someone they knew personally. Nor did they understand what following Jesus was actually going to look like. I mean, let me say that again. These first disciples, they didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And they didn't know what it was going to really look like to follow him. And nevertheless, when Jesus called them, they dropped everything and, and went. So let's stop. That's our our first section, and we're going to talk a little bit about some relevance, and we're going to move on to our second section. 
first thing I want us to note when we think about how is all this relevant today? There is a wonder that comes with following Jesus. When we first respond to Jesus' call, it's not like we know Jesus. When Jesus gets a hold of our hearts and we're like, all right, God, I'm following you. It's not like we really know Jesus or really know what it's like to follow him. That can only come with, with time, with experience, years of walking with God. And so much like the disciples, we're all in the same boat, right? Pun intended. We need to just trust and believe, okay, God, as I walk with you over time, you're going to make yourself trustworthy because I don't really know what this following you looks like. So I say this, take heart, new Christians out there, maybe watching, um, Walk by faith and believe that Jesus will show himself trustworthy over time. And Christians, you who have been a Christian for a long time, be patient with those who have only just started walking with Jesus. Number two thing I want to point out that's relevant, I think, for today. Remember Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. At a certain age, there's a couple of things here. At a certain age, we cannot rest on the faith of our parents, right? Living in a Christian home or having a Bible on our shelf isn't enough. God wants us to live faithful lives where we bear good fruit. Remember we talked about fruit? The Bible talks about fruit. It's just talking about the the actions of our lives. And do, do those actions represent God well or not so well? So let me add this. It's not about being perfect. But confessing our sins and working in this harmony with the one who is perfect and longs to change us from the inside out. Remember, John the Baptist told the Jews, don't just rest on the fact that you're a Jew. Many Jews thought that only those who had totally abandoned their faith or those that were not Jews were going to be in danger of being judged by God. And John says, no, don't rest on the fact that you are an ancestor of Abraham. You need to live lives that are bearing good fruit, worthy of repentance. Christians, we all at some point need to make that commitment on our own and not just do it because, or not just trust in that we're okay because we've grown up in a Christian home. In addition, the the Jesus of the Bible talked a lot about sin. Not the most popular topic, you know. But Jesus, the one we see portrayed in the Bible, in the Gospels, talked a great deal about sin. And I don't think this is a shocking statement. Sin is pretty much alive and well in our world today. Though at times I think uh, we have, as a society, tried to eradicate the concept. I'm going to read to you from a little bit here from a book by Ravi Zacharias, Can Man Live Without God? Now, in this chapter, he actually references this professor. He was a psychologist in America. Um, And I'm just going to read to you here. Basically, uh, this gentleman, the psychologist Hobart Maurer, he was one time president of the American Psychological Association. He taught at Harvard, Yale, and he wrote in 1960 this article. He said, For decades, we psychologists looked upon the whole matter of sin and moral accountability as a great incubus, which is basically this great demon, and acclaimed our liberation from it as epic-making. But at length, we have discovered that to be free in this sense, meaning to be free from this concept of sin, it has to have this excuse of being, let me put it, that is, to have the excuse of being sick rather than sinful is to court the danger of also becoming lost. Ravi goes on to say, in reaction to the state of near limbo, 
into which we have drifted, we have become suddenly aware, once again, of the problem of values and of their centrality, their essentialness to the human enterprise. He then goes on to quote Maurer again in that article, and Maurer actually quotes this psychiatric folk song, which essentially the folk song ends by saying this, when we lose the concept of sin, we begin to think that we are never wrong and someone else is always to blame. When we begin to lose the concept of sin, there is no more right or wrong. And when we do things that are wrong, it's, eh, it's someone else that caused it. And there's no longer a responsibility for our actions. You see, sin makes sense of our current condition, our fallen, broken, selfish hearts. And Jesus really then does make sense when he comes onto the scene that we see in this gospel. And he says, here in the gospel, repent, believe the good news. Now, it would be amiss to not mention that Ravi, who has passed away, great Christian apologist, is not, is not always done things right. There's a, unfortunately some things coming out about him and how he lived his life that wasn't good. And I've been following that um, story closely. And again, it just reminds us, even Christians, we can, we can be tempted. We can take our power and abuse it. We can forget to walk humbly with God. But it also reminds us, too, that we all need God's grace. And that what Ravi did in his life for God, we shouldn't throw out just because he did do some things that were not good. And so I just want to point out, more than anything, it stresses our need for a Savior, right? Third, the third thing I want to point out in our first section is this. If the Holy Spirit was intimately involved in Jesus' ministry and what he was doing, he better be all over what we're doing right? If we hope to be effective in whatever ministry God has called us to, whether that's ministering to people in our workplaces, our families, we know that's a key responsibility. We can't be effective in the, in the spheres of influence that God has given us if we don't have the Holy Spirit working in us. All right, ready for section two? It's going to go pretty quick. Section two here, we see Pretty much Jesus doing a bunch of healing and teaching and smack dab in the middle of all this. We see Jesus go off alone for a little bit and pray. All right, you guys ready? All right, let's read. Mark 1, 21 through 22. They went to Capernaum. So now Jesus has some of his disciples, his first disciples, and they go to the synagogue on a Sabbath and, be, and Jesus is teaching. And the people were what? There's our theme word right there, right? The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. You see, when Israel's teachers would teach, they would quote or reference other rabbis or teachers. They'd say, listen, this is what you need to do in your life, and I can support that statement by the fact that Rabbi so-and-so has said and made that same declaration. Jesus didn't teach that way. Jesus came out and said, this is what you need to do because I'm telling you to do it. I am the authoritative figure in this. I don't need to quote anyone else. I represent God in my teaching. Also, we see here in this section, when Jesus does teach, this is why I put in my notes, I think, and what I feel as I read the Gospels, is Jesus was outrageously humble in his authority. I mean, Jesus taught boldly and confidently about the person of God and his ways. There wasn't this arrogance in Jesus. Check out verses 20 through 26. Talk about drama, right? Could you imagine? We're only 20-some 20 uh, 20 verses in, and we see here right away Jesus is confronted by a man who's demon-possessed. In the synagogue. And this guy cries out and says, Jesus, what do you want with me? What's going on here? And Jesus, we're told, says, be quiet. Jesus is stern, he's firm, and out 
He says, evil spirit, and the impure spirit shook the man violently, came out of him with a shriek. Pretty weird. No doubt an amazing experience, not always in the good sense, but just like that was, un, that was just unbelievable what I just seen. Um, certainly memorable, right? Now, it's funny here. We can see this as almost ancillary to all of Jesus' ministry. Like, oh, yeah, he's faced with this dude, had a demon, and Jesus took care of it, and on he goes. But see, we forget that this, this is what Paul wrote in Ephesians. I'm flashing forward in the New Testament. Paul says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The spiritual realm is real. And if anybody who's ever spent some time delving into things that they shouldn't most often come back with the response, it's very real and very scary. The spiritual realm and the spiritual principalities that are against Jesus, the dark forces at work, they've been wreaking havoc on us and our world since the first human beings were created. We know that. So when Jesus confronts this spirit, tells a man to be quiet, and pulls that spirit right out of him, that's saying something huge about God and about Jesus. Jesus is truly the Son of God. No one was doing anything like this. And if you think I'm making that up, look at the next couple verses. The people were all amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching? The guy's teaching with authority and he gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. No doubt news spread all over the land about him. Right? This guy is amazing. Let's... Let's go into, very quickly, 1, 29, 31 through 34. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus, hey, mother-in-law's not feeling good. He went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. And I always pictured this as where she was just so thrilled and so amazed at being healed. She's like, I just, this is my natural response. What can I do in return? I'm just, gonna, I'm just going to serve you. I'm going to bless you. This is my return for, of gratitude for what you did. This is kind of what I get a feeling here in these verses. Then, after that, we see just the next couple of verses that evening. So Jesus is at Simon Peter's home. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Why was he not letting them speak? Because Jesus didn't want anybody to get this idea of this messianic or this messiah warlike hero and kind of take his ministry and hijack it in a direction he was not wanting it to go. So I think Jesus is like, let's keep it low right now. I'm not even got all my disciples yet. So I think there's, there's some wisdom in why that's being done for sure. Now, I'm going to skip section of 40 through 45, and I'm going to go to really quickly here. Then a man, so this is the last section in Mark 1. Then a man with a serious skin disease came to him and on his knees, Begged Jesus, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion. I mean, just imagine this scene for a minute. I mean, leprosy would have changed a person's entire world. We prayed for someone today about being lonely. Lepers were only allowed to be around other lepers. That means you were not allowed to be by your family, if you had children, a wife, a, a husband. If you contracted leprosy, you couldn't be around anyone except for other lepers. It would fundamentally change your entire life. And he comes to Jesus and he says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus, with compassion, reached out his hand, and he touched him. You know how important touch is, don't you? 
we know it's paramount in the lives of newborns. Newborns absolutely need to be touched for their health. Touch is so important. And Jesus reached out and touched someone who hadn't probably been touched in so long. And he made him clean. Immediately the disease left him and he was healed. Now in the preceding verses, Jesus says, hey, what I've done, don't tell anybody right now. I don't want to get us going in a direction that I'm not ready for yet. Just go and do what you're supposed to do. Moses gave some you know, uh, things that you're supposed to do according to the law. And just, just please go and keep this quiet. But the man cannot keep it quiet. He cannot. Let's bear that in mind. All right, so in the middle of all this, we're just about done, wrapping up here. In the middle of all this, so right before this story we looked at, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And then Simon and his companions went to look for him. They're like, man, Jesus, everyone's looking for you. Where are you? They want to be with you. They probably have more needs to, to have met. And Jesus says, it's time to go. I need to proclaim this message to others. Let's keep moving. All right. Second section. Brought it to a close. Let's talk about relevance here as we wrap up. A couple of things. Uh, one, remember minutes ago I mentioned about Jesus and these miracles that this section was just showing that these miracles that Jesus was doing, including you know exercising demons, this is all what basically is validating that God is behind Jesus' ministry. These miracles validate Jesus and his ministry. But we sometimes wonder, why don't we see many of these miracles on a consistent basis like we see in the Gospels? Kind of a fair question. I think we need to remember that what Jesus did, like I said, was very special. It won't be like today from the standpoint that we can't compare what we are experiencing today to what Jesus' ministry was doing in that specific period in time. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't heal today or that the miraculous doesn't take place. It certainly does. I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly believe that God wants us to pray for miracles and for healing but we get in Jesus' ministry this high concentration of miracles and healing because God is now present. And more than this, not more than this, but in addition to this, we see the heart of God. We see a little slice of God's kingdom on earth with Jesus. This is, this is God's intention, to heal, to help to love, to show compassion. When we wonder what God wants us to pray when someone is hurting or sick, it is for healing. That is the heart of God that we see happening in these miracles. Number two, sometimes I think we can think, well, gosh, I only have a fever. I just have a fever. I don't need to pray. God doesn't really care about that. He cares about the serious illnesses or the serious problems. God cares about it all. He cared about... You know, Peter's mother-in-law with the fever, he cared about those that were demon-possessed. He cared about the man who was a leper. Don't be afraid to take your prayer request to God just because they, seem, they are seemingly small or insignificant to you. God still cares. Number three, notice here, remember we've seen the guy who Jesus said, go and fulfill the law that Moses said, you're clean, go. Go do that. Don't go share this with everyone yet. Don't do that. This is an application, I think, for today. The right thing can still be wrong when we're not in step with God. I'm going to say that one more time. The right thing can still be wrong when we're not in step with God. And you can think about, I'm sure, your own examples of where, yeah, I guess you can, you can see how that would play out. We can be doing the right thing, but if God's not saying to do that, then it's not, it's not good. Jesus said, wait, don't tell everyone about me yet. And it actually affected Jesus' ministry. As we've seen here, Jesus was no longer able to enter towns openly. He had to stay in deserted places. Now, to end our time with just this final thought, if you were Simon, if you were Andrew, if you were John and James, 
once you think, this is chapter one. I mean, you were just getting started. Once you think, Jesus, you cease to amaze me. I mean, you really are ceasing to amaze me. And that is my hope and prayer for all of us this morning. So let me pray for you as we continue to think about how Jesus continues to amaze us. God, we pray that you would help us to see how you are at work today. God, in no sense did I mean with my words that I don't believe that you are at work, that you can't do the miraculous. God, we know that you are present in our lives. And we ask that you would help us, help us to understand you better, who you are and what you're like. And God, I pray that we would see you work in such a way that our hearts have nothing left to say, but Jesus, you cease to amaze us. God, we love you. We ask that you would be with us today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.